from the Joyce Meyer article, but just part of it, just to sort of ease us back in, where we on hook last week, I want to ease us back in this week. Uh, and this is something that she says. I grew up, Joyce Meyer, in a negative, unstable, and ab in abusive environment. This caused me to develop a negative mindset, attitude, and mouth that followed me into adulthood. So if you've been sadly having an upbringing with a lot of those areas, a lot of those things in, that will big time affect you as you grow up, as you become an adult, and you will take with you a negative mindset, a negative attitude, and a negative mouth. We have to understand and appreciate that. Now, she goes on to say, even after I knew the Lord, so she's born again, I was often filled with negativity, and it affected every area of my life. Maybe, she says, you can relate. Negative thoughts and damaging words are affecting millions of people every day. That is sadly so true. Negative thoughts and damaging words are affecting millions of people every day. Remember, we won't go there because we did last week, but in Proverbs it says that life and death is in the power of the, of the tongue, really in your mouth. Life and death. You can speak words of life, you can speak words of death. And, and then it goes on to say, and the man or the woman who does that will eat the fruit of that. So if you speak death, you'll, you'll eat the fruit of that, you will experience that. If you speak life, you'll experience that. Who wants to experience life? Yeah. For the longest time, she says, I saw the worst in people. I grumbled, I complained, and I constantly felt discouraged. It's a very sad uh, way to be, but so, so many people are. But, she says, as I began to study God's word, I began to understand the power of my words and how harmful negativity could be. I saw how negative thinking and speaking were affecting my life. See, unless you see that, unless you recognize it, then you will just continue on in that same vein. You have to see something to be able to confront it and change it in your life. I'm going to say that again. You have to see something to be able to confront it and change it in your life. So I started to make an effort to stop saying negative things. But my circumstances weren't, still weren't changing for the better. And even after months of trying to change, things were still the same. And I was frustrated with God. And she says, have you ever been there? One day, I complained to the Lord. Lord, I've stopped being negative and nothing has happened. Nothing has changed. Very clearly, I heard him speak to my heart. And this is what he said. You've stopped saying negative things, but you haven't started saying anything positive that lines up with my word. So often as Christians, as we get to know the Lord and we start to get to understand and know the word and some of these spiritual laws, we only get halfway and she was doing just that. She was stopping saying the negative. But if you don't add to that speaking the positive, which is lining up with God's word, you're not going to see the results God wants in your life. When Jesus said that he came to make you triumph, enable you to triumph, to make you more than a conqueror, that means in every area of your life, you will never experience the reality of that until you plug in to the way God says we're to speak. That's so very, very important. And so she said, I learned something important. Speaking negatively will hurt you. We're not looking at other people as well. It can be very damaging and hurt others. So we need to be aware of that. But speaking negatively will damage you. But speaking positively according to the promises of God so not speaking your circumstances, not speaking your negativity, but speaking what the word says, whether it looks like it or not, 
And that's where it takes faith, because faith is believing in something you can't see. So speaking positively according to the promises of God and his word will never, ever hurt you. In fact, will ultimately bless you. Now, we all want that. We all want to work, walk in the blessings of God. But then at times we get upset with God, we get angry with God or others sometimes because we're not flowing in the abundance of the grace and the goodness that God has for us. Now, that doesn't mean to say that all our circumstances will be perfect. Let's get that clear before we start. You can't speak having a perfect life. You can try and, and I think you can go a good way towards it. But you're never going to have a perfect life. Everything is not going to line up the way you want it until you get to heaven. And then it's going to be the way God wants it, but we're going to be so in tune with God that that's what we want anyway. Amen? Good. So uh, we need to understand that. Now, a couple of things, and I want to you know, hook onto this back again. Uh, the Israelites, remember, took 40 years to make really what was an 11-day journey. It's so ridiculous, isn't it? A journey from A to B, from Egypt to the Promised Land, should only have taken 11 days. It took them 40 years. Now, God was actually going to make it take them 40 days. He didn't want them to go from A to B in 11 days. You're not going to suddenly grow up and be super spiritual. Uh, we don't want you to be super spiritual anyway. We just want to be conformed to the image of Jesus. But to grow up and mature, it's not going to happen overnight. Everyone go, ah. Now, if you're older in the Lord, maybe you don't need to go, ah. Maybe you need to make sure that you are growing in that maturity. But the younger ones in the Lord, it takes time. It takes time to grow and mature. And so God had a plan to take them from Egypt into the promised land but he knew when he got it, they got in the promised land that they weren't just going to walk in. It was all going to be roses and buttercups or daffodils or whatever your flowers you prefer this morning. He knew that they were going to have to take the land already. And of course, a lot of this all ties in with what was happening here. Already, uh, the, uh, well, the, it hasn't happened yet. Well, in my mind, where, where the story's up to. But anyway, I'll forget that. You're not reading my mind. I, uh, what happened really was that the two spies went into the land and saw something different from the other ten. The Twelve spies went in. Ten of them came back with a negative report. There are giants in the land. Huge. Yes, there's lots of lush grapes and lots of good things to eat, but... There are huge, and apparently in those days there were a race that were absolutely huge. Obviously, uh, Goliath was one of them. And uh, so consequently, they came back with all the negative report. Oh, we can't do it. It's terrible. You know, yes, there's nice and good things, but this is hopeless. The situation's hopeless. They had absolutely not one ounce of faith. But you see, the thing is, God had given them a promise. And God had said, I will give you the land. The hopes and dreams that are in your heart that are given by the Lord, not your own things just materialized, but the things that are in your heart are going to take faith. There's going to be many, many battles that the enemy will come against you to try and get you and talk you out of what God has for you. Not just your destiny and the things that God has planned for what's up ahead for you, but just even the fulfillment of living a full life now. Health and strength and all those things that are really so important to live the abundant life that God has provided for us. There is an enemy out there, and he will do everything he can to try and get us out of the blessings that he's provided for us. So the children of Israel were going to have to go into the promised land and just battle with these armies. But really, just 11 days from leaving Egypt, they were just a bunch of slaves. But God had to train them. 
they had to learn through the battles that they faced. If you think you're going to float through your Christian life on flowery beds of ease and not have any battles, I'm telling you right now, you're not in the will of God. Well, I thought that was a good place to say amen, but you missed it, so never mind. See, we, what is it in us that we want everything easy? We want a comfortable life. But once you get the reality of every battle makes you stronger, once you get the reality of that, once you get the reality of that your faith in God grows because, Lord, I trusted you here, and God, you came through for me. So the next battle, bring it on. That's the attitude that you get. Again, listening to, to Joyce Meyer uh, on some of this teaching. And, uh, you know, she said as you get older in the Lord and you go through those battles, you don't shy away from them, but you face them head on with the word. She said, you just get to a place where it's, you know, okay, I've seen this before, been there, done that. And one good thing, having been saved, I think, almost 40 years, all the battles that happen now, you know, maybe have different faces and different elements, but I've seen it all before. Been there, done that. And it almost doesn't phase you. And you can enjoy the battles because you know God is working in you to perfect you. God is working in you to discipline you. You talk to Connor and he can give you some very good advice about the empowerment that discipline brings to your life. Discipline. The word says that, this is all free by the way, it's not in my notes at all, but the word says that God disciplines those whom he loves, isn't it? So, they kept murmuring and complaining. Question, are we delaying reaching our destiny like the Israelites because of what has been coming out of our mouth? Hmm. We all need to stop and think about that one, don't we? For example, are we complaining too much and not praising enough? Biggie. That's a good tweet. Are we, are we uh, complaining too much and not praising enough? Praising God for things that we want to see, even if we don't see them. Giving thanks to God for what we have, even if we're not completely happy or seeing exactly what we want to see. Just giving thanks for finding something to thank God for in our situation and in our circumstances. You know, you might be joining in in the coffee break uh, with people at work or complaining about the boss or complaining about this, complaining about the other. Uh, the word says that we are lights in the world in a crooked and perverse generation. Don't just side in and join in. Just dare to be different and say, well, yeah, I understand and leaving my joy and I choose to be joyful and grateful and thankful. It just, you enjoy life. You know, life is great. Whether good circumstances or not, life is great. Life is not, enjoyment of life is not in things or even in people. And they can add, but if you're dependent on people for your joy, because if they're going through a bad deal and they can't prop you up, we're here to prop others up. We're here to support and help others. So if we can only be thankful when everything is going our way, obviously even sinners can do that, even people who don't know Jesus. But we don't wait till things change to be thankful. You know, we can all say thank you when it's nice stuff going on. But when we're dealing with a streaming coal, which so many of you, bless you, seem to have been, and I'm talking to you about taking vitamin C, it's good to keep, in the natural, keep your, your body built up for the winter months. But, you know, every time I sneeze, those of you who've been around me, first thing, thank you, Jesus, healthy sneeze. You've heard me, don't I? 
Thank you, Jesus. Healthy sneeze. And you know, I've always done that. One day I was with Brother Hagen and he sneezed and he did exactly the same. And I said, Dad, I always say that. Really blessed me. <laughs> ah, right. So we can always find something to be grateful for. Always something to be happy about. Now, when I was a little girl, there were a lot of really good kind of sayings. You don't hear them that much these days. But sayings like, I suppose maybe as a kid I'd been complaining or something and, and my, my daddy said this to me. Um, uh, the, the story of the, of the little boy who complained he had no shoes until he saw a man with no feet. See, whatever your circumstances are, be aware there's people out there with it far, far worse. Far worse. When something bad happens in your life, someone hurt us or rejected us, God uses those things. Now, this is where the power comes in. Whatever bad has happened in your life, God can use it. It's never wasted. And he turns them around to work out for your good. We're going to look at Romans 8, 28. He turns them around to work out for your good. Romans 8, 28. Uh, which basically says, oh, but, oh no, it's in the Amplified, I'm going to read it. Romans 8. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Um, Romans 8. I love this. We are assured and known. This is the uh, New Living, I think, but I'm reading. We are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good to and for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. See, God has a plan. And do you think God ever gets to the stage of saying, well, I've got a plan for your life, but whoops, oh, I never expected that to happen. Oh, gosh, what on earth are we going to do now? You know, we tend to think God thinks like us. He doesn't. God's ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. God knows all the bad things that are going to happen to us. But he's got a plan. And his plan is bigger. As long as...